Good morning, I'm Bonnie Williams and I'll be assisting with the service this morning. We'd like to welcome everyone. We are a member of the United Church of Christ. That means no matter who you are, no matter where you are in life's journey, you're welcome here and we're more complete for having you. Do we have any announcements today? Okay, Terry. I have my fellowship hat on now. I want to make sure everybody is aware that we have a planned outing on Friday to go see Claudia in a play at Chagrin Valley Theater, Chagrin Valley Little Theater in Chagrin Falls. But we, it is Sherwood, the tales of Robin Hood and his merry men or women in Claudia's case. So picture Claudia as a merry woman. So we are, it's Friday night, the, the show is 7.30, not 8 o'clock. Claudia wanted to make sure that we knew that. There's plenty of tickets to buy at the door, but any that would like to meet here at 5.30, we'll bring appetizers to share and you, you know, BYOB, if you, your beverage of your choice, and we'll gather together for a little fellowship time here, and then we'll go on over to Chagrin Falls. If anyone has any questions, see me, or if you think you're interested, see me, so we have some idea, but Claudia assured me there's plenty of tickets. Anyone else? Yeah, yeah there will be, um, the annual meeting will be following the worship service immediately after church. I am having people sign in already if you're planning on staying so that we can kind of move things along. Uh, we will vote on the budget. I will explain to you the officer situation, and which is not bad. But, um, and then uh, we'll talk <laughs> about anything else that may need to come up before us. So that'll be immediately after church. Um, we'll get this going right away. Thank you. Yeah, coffee later after, after I dismiss you. <laughs> okay. okay. Don't see any more. Do we have any birthdays or anniversaries? <laughs> Rich's birthday was yesterday. <laughs> Our opening hymn will be Be Thou My Vision. That should be the Pilgrim Hymnal Red One, uh, 391. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord.
As our call to worship today is from Matthew 6, verses 24 to 34. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. We cast all our anxiety on God because God cares for us. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they? We remember that even the hairs of our heads are all counted. We are not afraid, for we know that we are of more value than many sparrows. Therefore, do not worry, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear? We refuse to worry. We will strive first for the kingdom of God and its righteousness. And let us pray. Lord, we know that it is a spiritual battle for us to see you in this world. We ask you to be our vision. We ask you to open the eyes of our hearts that we may see the way that you provide for us day by day. You work in this world and in our lives for your glory. Now bless the service, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Thank you, Bonnie, for uh, reading today. We prepare for our offering this morning. And the Lord says, For every beast of the field is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. And so God has that kind of provision for us. And so as we give today, let us give not fearing that God will run out of his provision, but to share in the bountifulness and God's bounty and his provision for us. So please come and receive, we'll receive the morning offering. <laughs> send their jokes in so we can hear them. <laughs> <laughs>
I learned a prayer. Oh, what kind of prayer did you learn? Well, it starts out, Our Father who art in heaven. Wow. Do you know that prayer? Have you heard it before? You've heard it before? Well, you're dismissed before we pray it, but it's a prayer we pray in church. It's called the Lord's Prayer. It is in Matthew chapter 6, which is the passage we're reading today, though we won't read the Lord's Prayer itself. But the prayer tells us to address God as our Father. You know, it, as Jesus was talking about praying, he said the Gentiles, the people who don't believe in God, they pray, but they pray to Zeus, or they pray to Jupiter, or they pray to other gods and goddesses. And they think that they have to get those gods' attention. But that prayer that you just started there, uh, Spot, tells us that God is our Father. Now that isn't necessarily speaking about gender, that doesn't apply to God, but that is relationship. Because God is our Daddy that loves us so much that we don't have to yell and scream to get his attention. We don't have to say certain words to get his attention. We just have to look up to heaven or in our hearts and say, Our Father who art in heaven, and God is that close to us. Yeah, that's why I like that prayer. Our Father who art in heaven. And uh, I guess I'll remember the rest of it later. Okay, Spot, that would be a good thing. Well, have a good time in Sunday school this morning. We will. At least it'll be quiet without the boys there. <laughs> it'll be quiet. Won't be as funny. No more jokes. Eddie <laughs> also told me a joke. <laughs> Amen. Yes, when we come to God and call him our father, it is, like I said, not the idea of gender. It's not God, father, or mother, but it's God relationship. And so that's what we're invited to come to the one who is has that relationship with us, a loving parent, a loving father. As we come to prayer time this morning, let us share our prayer requests with one another. If you have a request, we'll have the microphone come by and please speak into it. I'd like prayers for uh, my son, Will. He had a little accident yesterday. Hmm. He uh, was in a competition for snowboarding and fell wrong. So he ended up breaking his collarbone. Hmm. Uh, he's in a little pain. Uh, not sure if he's going to need surgery or not, but he's got an appointment tomorrow with an orthopedic surgeon. So, uh, just prayers for him. Thank you. All right. Pray for Will. Anyone else? Thank you. Um, just an announcement about come upcoming Lent. During the season of Lent, uh, especially the Wednesdays in the March, what it's going to turn out to be, we'll be having a soup and Bible discussion here. It's going to be over a little, uh, or a plan called um, Encountering Jesus and taking some scriptures, looking at them, and how do we encounter Jesus in our life day by day. So plan for that. Plan to bring us, we'll share soup. People bring it different weeks. And then we'll have this Bible discussion on Wednesdays here at the church during Lent. Any other requests? Definitely pray for the situation in our country. It is always horrible to wit to uh, it is, it is always tragic as we witness horror played out on our TVs, and uh, to see the abuse of that young man in in Tennessee, it has been ter just horrible. And uh, so we need to pray. The cruelty that is out there, the abuse of power that is out there, and then how things just get out of control, and how the Spirit of God needs to be working in so many places. Let's look to the Lord now in prayer. Loving God, 
In a culture that is more preoccupied with satisfying meal preferences than making sure that all are fed, we are guilty of too much worry. Forgive us, Lord, for needless worry. Forgive us, Lord, for any worry that is rooted in selfishness. Teach us, Lord, the grace of waiting patiently when we are in genuine need. Remind us, Lord, that you are both the Lord of the sparrows and the Lord of our lives. Remind us, Lord, that you are the, are the source of all that we need. And we especially look today, O oh Lord, and ask that you be with Will, suffering this accident in the snowboard. I ask, O oh God, that you would direct the way that he that the doctors were to treat him. Thank you, O oh Lord, that he was not even more seriously injured, but we the, be with him as he's recovered with his broken collarbone and the doctors as they decide and which is best to, way to, to approach it. Lord, we pray also for Andrea and Joe as they are traveling, the loss of the sister, the horrible situation that has come because of that. Oh, Lord, I pray that you be with them. I pray, dear God, also for my friend Fred as he's lost his wife and had the service yesterday. I ask that you would be and encourage him. And, Lord, the horrors that we see sometimes unfolding on TV from people who should be trained to do better, to know better, we are confused, O oh Lord, but we see how fast the horrors of cruelty get out of hand, how fast the abuse of power can manifest itself. So, O oh Lord, today, as a nation, teach us what we need to do, what we need to be, that we do not have situations like this. Lord, be with the family of the young man today. We especially have heard the voice of his mother calling out her trust in you and her desire to see your will done. Be with her, the father, and the rest of the family also. Now, Lord, each of us have a prayer in our hearts, so hear us as we call out to you. Hear our prayer, O oh Lord, because you are the one that is the supplier of all that we need. You're the one that opens your hand, and all the creatures of the earth are fed. So today, O oh Lord, help us to trust in your abundant supply as we follow the one who also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us... Take our new century hymnals, the black hymnal for 519 if you need them. It's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, or not my brother nor my sister, standing in the need of prayer. The old spiritual. So standing together, standing in the need of prayer.
Thank you. Please be seated. Today's message comes from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, and I'll be reading verses 24 through 34. Matthew, chapter 6, 24 through 34. There's a lot to say about Matthew, chapter 6. As I mentioned earlier, the Lord's Prayer is here. A lot of issues about praying and trusting is really the idea behind most of the uh, this part of Jesus' sermon on the mount. One little thing that maybe we think about, I'm trying to think about it, but I heard a seminary teacher this week, professor, talking on his podcast and saying that the book of Matthew has as his outline the Lord's Prayer. And I'm trying to, trying to think that through and see how the Lord's Prayer is really the basis of so much of what is said in the book of Matthew. So now we hear the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ from Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters, for a slave will either hate the one and love the other, or be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, or about your body, what you will wear. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are, they, are you not of more value than they? And can any one of you, by worry, add a single hour to the span of your life? And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how that they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothed the grass of the field, which is alive today and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, he will not, he will, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what will we drink? Or what will we wear? For it is the Gentiles who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. But strive for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you. So do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. Tomorrow's, uh, today's trouble is enough for today. This is the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now, O oh Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O oh Lord our strength and redeemer. Amen. Whenever I read this passage here, I think of that little song by uh, Bobby McFerrin. Don't worry, be happy. We like that song. It was real popular back of, you know, half dozen years, year, dozen years or so ago. But the words, as we think about that song, and I won't whistle for it for you right now. But as we consider the words of Jesus and compare them to the words of Bobby McFerrin, we see that they take this idea of worrying from a very different perspective or point of view. To McFerrin, if something bad happens, you know, you lose your job, you get thrown out of your apartment, you just don't think about it. Don't worry. Be happy. Just ignore it. But Jesus is come calling us, calls us to come to this kingdom, calls us to come to this special life of no worry. Because you see the reality of around you. In God's kingdom, God is the one that provides for us. Everything in his kingdom and in his kingdom is in relationship to your heavenly father. I think of a passage that the book of Isaiah, the prophet Isaiah wrote, Isaiah 49, 14 through 16, a great illustration, an amazing image of God 
And I want us to think about that today in the context of worry. But uh, Isaiah, Isaiah writes, But Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me, and my Lord has forgotten me. Can a woman forget her nursing child? and not have compassion on the son of her womb, surely they, will, they may forget, yet I will not forget you. See, I have inscribed you in the palms of my hands. Your walls are continually before me. Here, the, the Isaiah has, and the people of Israel have witnessed, are witnessing Jerusalem being destroyed the people being taken off as captives. And the people, the Jews, are standing around wondering and seeing the destruction and devastation and says, wait a second, has the Lord forsaken us? Where's God in all of this? Why are we abandoned in this way? Has the Lord forsaken us? And you see, this is not just a question. It is a challenge. It's a challenge that each of us face day by day. Is God really concerned about me? Does God really care about the situation that I face in my life? So this is challenging God's concern and ability to care for us. And in this passage here, the words that God is speaking to the prophet Isaiah, he uses two illustrations to confront that challenge. Verse 15, he talks about a nursing mother that does not forget her sucking child. When I was young, I always think about this when I read this passage, but we had a neighbor, and my mom and she were having babies at the same time. I was the oldest. And I remember sitting in the kitchen one time playing, and my mom and our neighbor was talking, and our neighbor saw all of a sudden said, well, I'm leaking. I got to go and feed my baby. <clears throat> and, you know, she was saying, I, I, I felt it in my own body that my child needs me. I have to provide something for my child. That's exactly what God is saying here. In God's inner being, in her depths of her soul, God feels the need and knows that we have needs that she must provide for us. God also says in verse 16 that you're graven in the palm of my hand. There is a picture that God has tattooed in her hand as we read this passage here. That picture is her chosen ones. And it's represented by a picture of of the walls of Jerusalem. And here she longs as she looks at her hand at the uh, precious walls of Jerusalem. Even though they are destroyed, even though Judah has been carried off into captivity, the precious picture is there. Now, I don't know how many of you have tattoos. When I was growing up, only bikers and the guys from the military had tattoos. But they are very popular today, and you see quite a bit talking about them. Some are, some are interesting and nice, and some are just, you paid $300 for that? <laughs> wow, $600, $800. But a while back, I had an experience with, with a young man with tattoos. I was heard that if you want to, have a conversation with someone, they have tattoos, ask them about them. What it mean, what does this mean to you? And so one day, Karen and I were up here at the subway. We were going through for lunch, and a young man was making my sandwich, and he had a tattoo on both of his arms, one of the Celtic cross and the other of the Celtic knot or the Celtic trinity symbol. And I asked him about it. He said, oh, yeah, that's my faith, but it means something else also. And so we walked along. There's other people in line. Soon the line cleared up, and Karen and I were sitting at a table eating, and he came over with his lunch and sat at the table next to us. And so I asked him, I said, well, what is the story behind your tattoos? And he got very excited, and he was really happy. So he went back into the back room, came out with a set of keys, his keys. And on his keys, there was a ring 
a ring that had a Celtic cross graven in it or on it. And he began to tell me that there was a day that he and his grandmother spent all day just by themselves. And they went places and they enjoyed such a great day. And in that trip and in those day, that day he spent with his grandmother, she bought him this ring with the Celtic cross on it. And so he says, so in honor of my grandmother, to remember her, I've tattooed these Celtic symbols on my arm. That's exactly what's going on here. Every time that young man looked at his arm, he remembered his grandmother. He remembered their special day together. Every time that God looks at her hand, she sees the walls of Jerusalem and the precious part of her people there. That is what's happening here. So let's come back to Matthew. In Matthew, at the end of the book, we will see the king, this God the Son. He will be wounded for our transgressions. He will be bruised for our iniquity. He will be chastised for our peace. And by his very stripes, we are healed. And in glory, Jesus has marks on his hands of, that remind him of how much he loves you. The nail prints are there. The resurrected Christ still had the prints in his hands, and that's how much Jesus loves you. The command not to worry is not a command to ignore what's going on around us. It is a command to meditate upon and find our satisfaction in the care and love of our Heavenly Father. He first leads us to a comparison involving greater and lesser. Life, more than food. Body, more than clothes. So we're being compared. What is greater? Life or food? Body or clothes? God has provided you life. He's given you a body. And that is a great provision. Was it, won't he even provide the lesser things for you? Then, here Jesus gives us two pictures from nature. First, one is that God cares for birds that don't even store up for future. Don't you think that he cares for you? He arrays the flowers of the field more than the greatest king of all in Israel. They are arrayed more beautiful than Solomon himself. He cares about your clothing, too. And notice that he is not really talking to us about food and clothes, because in verse 25 he says, don't worry about your life. The issue that we're talking about here is not worry over things, but worry about living, about our life. It is about the things that cause us to worry and the things that destroy our quality of our life, our peace, and our serenity. I've been part of a recovery program for quite a long time. And in recovery, we say that there are two things that will destroy your serenity. The first is yesterday with all of its dread, uh, with all of its regrets, with all of its should haves, with all of its what ifs. And the other thing that can destroy your serenity is tomorrow with all of its dreads and all of its fears and all of its uncertainties. There is nothing that at all that we can change what happened yesterday. Yesterday is done. And tomorrow, well, tomorrow the sun will come up. It may come up behind the clouds. It may come up underneath a, a mountain of snow falling out of the sky. But the sun will rise tomorrow. And until then, tomorrow doesn't exist. So we have to worry about or we have to concentrate on today. 
we must face today with whatever troubles that comes with it. And then in verse 31, we're given the indication that Jesus is not talking about starvation and nakedness. I think he really talks what's going on with us here in the 21st century as Americans. It is when we stand in front of our closets that are stuffed with clothes and go, I don't have anything to wear. Or we go to the refrigerator and open the door and keep things from falling out and look in and go, there's nothing to eat in there. And we have five faucets in our house all giving drinkable water. I don't have anything to drink today. You see, that's the way it is. The idea of it's it's we feel shortchanged if our clothes are not in fashion. We hunger when we can't go through our favorite restaurants drive through for a snack. We avoid restaurants that don't serve our favorite drink. They may have be a Pepsi place and being a Coke person, I don't go there. Or they may be a Coke place and I'm a Pepsi guy. I don't go there. And that's fine. But in all of these things, we are irritated. We are full of concern that we don't have it as good as someone else. And that's where the worry is. Do I have life as good as someone else? Do I have nothing to wear because my clothes aren't in fashion? Do I have nothing to eat because, well, it's all in the refrigerator. I don't want to cook it for myself. These are the kinds of things that are, we're confronted with. This kind of worry, this kind of discomfort, this kind of loss of serenity comes to us in, it really in the face of a multiple supply of, of everything that we really want. We, we, we want to, we're irritated, we're, cons, we're full of concern that we don't have it as good as someone else. We used to call that keeping up with the Joneses. I think now it's just the American dream. We want to dream of a life where we can be dis, 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 uh, or, or un, uh, upset about what we have or dissatisfied with what we have. This is the kind of life the Gentiles lead, live. Those without a God that is a heavenly father that loves them. But you are different. We have someone that cares for us. Verse 32 says, for your heavenly father knows that you need these things. Do you have a caring, gracious Father that knows your desires, your needs in the area of food and clothing. You see, the problem with worry is that it challenges that quality of God. When we worry, we challenge, does God really know about us? Does God really care about us? Is God really involved in my life? Worry is wrong because it challenges the quality of God as a caring, gracious Father. Now let's be practical. Some have been impractical with the words of Jesus here. That he is not telling us that we quit our jobs, that we spend out our bank accounts, that we uh, come to a place where we have no grocery money for the coming week, that would contradict other scriptures telling us how we're to live our lives. But I think Paul is, it, it puts his finger right on it in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 8. And having food and clothing, with these we shall be content. It is the contentment, the peace that God wants us to experience. When we have the basic necessities, then we need to work on being content. Paul shows us 
the real root of the problem a couple of verses later. He says, for the love of money is the, a root of all kinds of evil, for which some have struggled from the faith or strayed from the faith in their greediness and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. So the kingdom life is disrupted by greediness. That is why Jesus taught in verse 24 that you can't serve God and money. The thing about money is, if you love it, you can't get enough. Toward the end of his life, someone was interviewing a, a John D. Rockefeller. And he was, John D. Rockefeller was probably the first billionaire in history. And there he had an unimaginable amount of money in the early 20th century, a billion dollars. No one could even think about that. The, the government of the United States didn't, probably didn't spend much more than that each year. And uh, the interviewer was asking him, how much more money will make you happy? And John D. Rockefeller thought for a second. He said, oh, just a little more. You see, when we have money, where we love money, we can't get enough. We're never satisfied. When we seek God's kingdom and his righteousness, first of all, then all our desires will fall into place. Verse 33 does not teach us that things come to us automatically but that we have, when we have a proper view of things, we will find that place in the kingdom of God, that place of security, realizing we have a heavenly Father that loves us. I want you to try something this week. Whenever you catch yourself worrying, I want you to take out a little note and write it down. I'm worrying about this. Write down what you worry about. And then maybe in the evening, pull that card out and look at it again and prayerfully begin thinking about it and consider how you can trust your Heavenly Father with each of these worries. How does my Heavenly Father want me to deal with this? I think if we do that, we will go through our heart and see how we do have a God in heaven that cares for us and provides for us. Let us pray. Extravagant God, you have promised treasure in heaven that outweighs any we could envision or imagine on this earth. Help us to be grateful for the amazing gifts you have already given to us. We pray these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Let's take the uh, New Covenant, the Black Hymnal, turn to 199, with this, Alas, and did my Savior bleed, or at the cross, it's called in some books. But this is teaching us, telling us about Jesus Christ bleeding. Remember, God says that she has Jerusalem engraved upon her, to her hand. She's a mother get, that will not forget her nursing child. She holds the picture in her hand. And so here we're talking about Jesus dying on the cross, and he now has the marks of his love in his hands in heaven. Alas, and did my Savior bleed. Standing together, please.
refrain of this song was written by a professor at Mount Union College in Alliance. So let's note at the bottom of the page there. So let us lead a life not of ignoring what's going on around us, but a life of looking at opportunities that we can trust and entrust things to our loving, caring, let us pray. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant to you to live in harmony with one another in accordance with Christ Jesus, so that together you may with one voice glorify God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forevermore. Amen. God bless. We're dismissed, and we will reassemble shortly for the uh, annual meeting.
I already have them. Yep, she linked me to it so I could see. We've had five. So. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, because I, I even had a. Lisa, are you going to take notes from back there, or you want to? Okay. All right. Um, I will call the meeting to order at whatever time it is. 11.28. Thank you. And Pastor Greg, would you like to lead us in a short prayer? <laughs> Just a thought from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. For, by, for in one spirit we're all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we're made to drink of one spirit. Now you are the body of Christ and individual members of it. And that is what we're here to do today, to be the body of Christ. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you that... Throughout history, through your church, our Lord Jesus Christ has used his body to, to accomplish his work on earth. So, Lord, may we continue to that great honor, that great calling, to be Christ's hands, Christ's feet, Christ's voice, and Christ's compassion, reaching out to the people around us. Bless now this meeting, we pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Okay. Um, first of all, after last year's election and all that other good stuff, I, I happened to sit and read the Constitution and bylaws and highlighted stuff that was important. Like, for instance, uh, to have a quorum at the meetings, you have to have 15% of your membership. Well, with 11 people here, we have a quorum, so we are very good as far as that goes. Um, but as I read further into it, when we changed the Constitution, we changed the number of years that the officers held their positions. And um, that changed to uh, basically all of the officers except for the treasurer and the financial secretary, was a two-year term. So that's why we're not voting for officers again, because basically last year you voted for it, and it's for two years. So I got one more year to go, and then we'll turn it over to some other people. Um, the, the treasurer and financial secretary, Sherry and Rick, you're for four years, sorry. You, 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 you're stuck, but, and we appreciate all the work that you do. So that being said, that is why we are not having an officer election at this point. Next year, we'll, we will elect new officers. Um, so basically, the main thing that we have to talk about would be our budget. If you looked at, if you got the, the report in the email, um, the committees, the committee chairs, when I look at the, the way we have our constitution, you have committee chairs, you don't have committees, which, I really don't like. I mean, the poor committee chair people work to death, and they have nobody really to help them unless people volunteer to help. And um, every five years, we're supposed to look at the Constitution, and this Constitution was in, wait a minute, can't read it, 2018. So this year, we should be looking at revising the Constitution again or, and getting it ready to present maybe next year at the annual meeting. So if you'd like to be on that committee, because I want to put that together with some people that would work together separate and you know take a look at our Constitution and see what we can do to make some changes. Um, but as far as that goes, um, the committee reports, everybody did really well. Um, 
Sherry, do you want to say anything about our financial situation? I mean, Mm -hmm. Just because we only have like a fellowship person, me for fellowship, but even if we don't have formal committees offering to help, if, if like Bonnie is the only person for diaconate and she would probably appreciate people saying, hey, I'll help with communion some, some month. So, and, and, and uh, we have three trustees, we have just have a couple trustees, there's lots of little jobs around the church. It still certainly doesn't mean. Absolutely. We'll take any volunteers we can get. So, and like for fellowship, you know, we have the idea of a theater program this week. If somebody has some other ideas, bring them to me. We'll be more than willing to take a look at that. Okay. Thank you. Um, so, Sherry, do you have anything to say other than the report? Um, Right, we're we're spending more than we're right, right. So, and that that sooner or later is going to catch up to us. Um, it's a little bit of a concern for sure. You know, we know we have the funds all tucked away in different accounts, but we don't want to keep drawing from them. Um, you know, we sold the parsonage, and that was a nice chunk of change. But sooner or later, that money's going to run out. So, um, you know, we and the order to bring in income. We need people in the pews. So we need people that are willing to come and work and share in God's work with us and, and let them know we're alive on the square. We're here. So, okay, Rick, do you have anything? Okay. Um, any of the count, any of the committee chair people have anything they want to say? Okay. The report is there. It it was very nicely put together. I think, um, you know, people worked hard on on their reports and turned those in. So, um, let's get to the budget. I didn't do it. He did. <laughs> So everybody should have the printout there. Uh, we were going to try and do that. But again, everybody should have the printout. Um, I mean, basically the two, I mean, the, everybody knows the last couple of years have been incredibly weird with COVID. We weren't here. We were trying to do it online. So that cut our cost back some. Um, you know, for the last two years, we didn't have a full-time pastor. That wasn't very much fun. So, you know, the two biggest changes that happened over this past year was, again, the selling off of the parsonage and Reverend Hogan joining us. Um, so, you know, that's kind of reflected in when you look at the numbers over the last couple of years and then the proposed budget for 2023. Um, so, I mean, as you're looking down all the line items, we've kept as much as we could. Um, it was all pretty much um, across the board. The two biggest changes, uh, like I said, the parsonage costs are now at zero. And there's a, you know, a, a, a slight uptick in our pastoral numbers because we finally have somebody in place. But I mean, the biggest number, you look at the bottom, um, we're looking at our, an annual budget of uh, basically $94,000. Um, as has already been stated, if we can get more people in, numbers will increase we are drawing down some of the reserve funds but I mean fortunately I mean, it's been great we're seeing more people come in over the last couple months so um, other than that um, any specific questions that we can address
Yeah, um, we did. We did give increases to our our paid, um, our custodian and our organist. Um, and I don't know if you any of you noticed it or not, but the choir director line has been removed since we don't have a choir director. And we talked with Chrissy about trying to do a setting up like a technology person and she felt that is not a paid position and she's doing it out of the goodness of her heart and you know we want to thank her for all that hard work um, it, it works well when it's working and when you have a picture and you find out what button you got to push to make the picture show <laughs> up <laughs> so um, and so that helps too and um, you know if you look at the budget we also took out the Christian ed budget and the camp budget. We were we were putting in a thousand dollars a year for camp for kids for to go to camp. Well, our kids are a little bit little right now and aren't ready to go to camp. So um, the hope is that you know by the time they're ready, we'll be able to put put another line back in so that we have a camp line in our budget and we can increase the Christian Ed budget. Right now, Christian Ed, all the materials are paid for by the parents of our children. They don't even run the bills through the church. So that is the, their way of giving to the church. And the kids like picking up the offering. That is their way of doing their job. Terry and I have told them that's their job, and they take it very seriously. So um, it's important that they feel important to us. So any other questions? All right. Do we have a second? I have one, I guess. We need to... Okay. Can we have a motion to accept the... The budget as presented, Yvette, second please. Richard, all those in favor, aye. aye. Anyone opposed? All right, anything else we need to bring before the church? Yes, Richard. Thank you, Rich. Terry? I said, although we certainly love to see the people in, in the pews, we have, to, we have to say that the technology is working and, and in following the, the viewers and the viewers on our Facebook page and you know, seeing how many people are picking up these services, I keep seeing these names that I've never seen before. So we, we have to acknowledge that that is a valued part of our congregation, too, although yes, we do love to see people. It's a different time when people are maybe better able to watch YouTube on Wednesday night because that's convenient for them instead of getting here Sunday morning. But, so that is still an important, and many and you people in, may often support us financially too. So I just want to point out, don't forget about that piece, and it is important, and that is a very big positive that has come out of the money work we've done in technology, Chrissy's work, you know, the, you know, just changing our ways of doing things. Yeah. Well, some of you may not know that my oldest brother moved and his wife moved to Texas. And he, he loves the technology because they feel, still feel that they're at home watching church. And we talk every Sunday night and, you know, he'll say to me, well, you know, he growled about my not picture on the camera, you know, when I worked the camera. But, um, you know, he, he loves to see and he, he'll say, oh, I saw this person and this person. And, you know, he looks at the back of heads because I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not sure if it shows the front, but he does like to look at church and, and see that people are here. So um, it is definitely a blessing, and we're reaching to Texas, so that's that's far away. Yes, Peggy. Um, I believe everybody that we've seen at Pub Theology has been at church. There were a couple that. Well, when Kristen joined us, Kristen and her husband Chris, but 
they pop in a lot, so, you know, and that's fine. If that's what they want to do, that's fine. So, pub theology is a lot of, a lot of fun. So, anything else? All right. Well, then, if nothing else, can I have a motion that we adjourn? Okay, somebody wants to motion. <laughs> Jim? <laughs> Nobody else budged. All those... Oh, that's true. That's true. Okay. All right. So is that what you're doing? Accepting all the reports? <laughs> Good job, Dan. Dan has moved that we accept all